Welcome to Cars Yeah! Show number 67, part one of a two-part show with Chris Rungi. This is Cars Yeah! Where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah! Do you love vintage cars? Then go to CarsYeah.com and get a free copy of the fantastic Filler Up book. It's a full-color ebook filled with fuel filler fun with over 60 color photographs of vintage cars plus inspirational quotes from some of the most famous automotive enthusiasts of all time. Simply go to CarsYeah.com, click on the free book button on the home page, and download your Filler Up book today. It's free at CarsYeah.com. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. Today, I'm very excited to introduce my talented guest, Chris Rungi. Chris, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I am ready. All right. It's great to have you here. Chris Rungi owns and operates Rungi Carrosserie and Flyer Motorworks. Flyer Motorworks began in a rural Minnesota barn, the very place where Chris, 25 years prior, set in his first Porsche, while it was being stored for the winter. That Porsche left an impression, and he would never forget it. A lifelong passion for the automobile, and more specifically post-World War II German design, grew as Chris owned and modified several Porsche vehicles over the years. Then in 2011, he embarked upon a new journey. With hammer in hand, he created his own aluminum-bodied car. The goal was not to build a replica, but capture an era through a simple yet beautiful design. In the process, Chris applied traditional European coachwork techniques to build the prototype Frankfurt Flyer, a sports racer he calls the FF001. It gained attention and admiration in the motoring world, and today Chris is preparing to introduce a series of coach-built auto designs based on different eras and different countries of origin. Rungi Carrosserie can also provide panel replacement, repair, or reskin an entire body for your vintage car. And you can also design and build from scratch your very own custom coach-built automobile. So Chris, I've told our listeners a little bit about you, so please take some time and share some more about your history, your career, your interests, and of course, your passion for automobiles. All right, well, thanks for having me on the show, Mark. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to chat with you. Um my history with cars and and design really goes back, I think it's kind of in my heritage a little bit. My grandfather was a machinist, and my grandmother was a machinist as well. They both worked in a machine shop oh, in wow. Rockford, Illinois. Yeah, so, um, you know, as far as working with tools and working with hand, your hands and, and creating, that's kind of been in my in my blood since I was born. I grew up here on a rural hobby farm in Minnesota. I was born in 1980, so I'm 34 years old. And from birth, I have had a fascination with anything that was wheeled. So from cars to skateboards, bikes, I would modify my wagons. When I was a little kid, I'd take them apart and modify them, put (laughs) feeding in them, and and try to uh, hook up steering linkage so they, they could be steered. So I've always been tinkering and doing that sort of thing. Growing up, my dad was, uh, he, he liked to tinker and he liked to fix up cars. By trade, he was an electrical contractor here in, in Minnesota. We always had some kind of a project going around our, our house. And when I was really young, we used our barns here on the hobby farm for storage. And then we also had animals. So we had a lot of cars coming in and out during the fall and spring and motorcycles as well and one year a uh, Porsche showed up it was a little 914 and that car really fascinated me because something about the idea that this car looked like it could drive backwards or forwards oh yeah <laughs> uh-huh. the symmetry yeah that, that there's something about that type of design that just really fascinated me and so this car when it was driven to our barn it was in fairly decent shape and it had a cover on it and I remember I'd, I'd sneak out there. I wasn't supposed to touch the car, of course, and I'd sneak out there and 
lifts the cover up and that uh, door handle with the classic Porsche click, you know, and open oh, it up yeah. and <laughs> climb in there and, and away I'd go. I'd be racing and not literally, but, you know, in my imagination, I was winning Le Mans at age seven. Of so course. It, it was, yeah, it was, a, it was quite the experience. And that car stayed here for quite a while and it ended up really deteriorating. And after a few years, a friend of the owner came and and he and my dad had permission to try to get the car running again and it was in pretty rough shape shape but they did get it running and I remember it going up and down the road and then it went away it left an impression on me with uh, German design and specifically an interest in Porsche from there I uh, modified as a teenager several bicycles customized them made these these low riders and uh I got into vintage Schwinn crate bikes, the Apple crates. Oh, um, yeah, I had an orange crate. <laughs> yeah, yep. So I had several of those, and at that time, they were, for me as a teenager, they were fairly affordable, and I, I just really enjoyed restoring them and fixing them up. Then as I moved into the driving years, my dad and I picked up a 1951 GMC when I was 13 years old, and, you know, for for most, that wouldn't be driving years. But here in rural Minnesota, with the gravel roads around our area, I was able to get in that truck and cruise around after we had gotten it running and fixed up. And it was really a fun experience, just the feel and the sound and the smell. Um, it really sparked something in me. Oh, yeah. And when I was old enough to drive, I, I started fixing up on a Chevy Nova and restored that. And that was my first. Uh, official car that I was old enough to drive. And then I kind of got into this practice of fixing them up and selling them. And so I went from American hot rod stuff to old Volkswagens. As most people with with Volkswagens can say, there's so many stories that go with those cars. I, <laughs> I have some really fun experiences with pulling cars out of fields and learning the difference between 12 volt and 6 volt yeah, <laughs> systems. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that kind of shaped my, I guess, my my stance on modifying and, and fixing on these old German cars. And then when I was old enough to, uh, or able to afford a Porsche, we were in the position to get a 1978 911 Targa. Oh, cool. Uh, it was an SC Targa. Yeah, and that car had already been modified pretty heavily. That really set the tone for... Um, my Porsche <laughs> passion. Yeah. It was just such a blast to drive. And from there, I was able to uh, fix that one up and, and then we sold it a few years later. One one Porsche after another, I continued this process of, of modifying and, and adding my own uh, tweaks and design cues. And, you know, one one car that I built was kind of a, rally mid 70s style rally car and then i did some concord prep on i had an 87 slant nose factory slant nose oh so, wow yeah a, a lot of a lot of fun with those cars and um you know financially through this time i started out on when i kind of going out on my own and making a living for myself i started out as a, a professional snowboarder in the mid 90s so 1996 97 and doing competitions and things like that traveling around the world and had a really great time with that and my family and, and friends were very supportive in, in that and helped me get to where I could make a living at it and I did that until 2006 and then uh, so I was 26 years old and then my contracts were with snowboarding were coming to an end and I had the opportunity to um, start a business in the petroleum industry. And my dad and I are both entrepreneurs and kind of a dangerous combination sometimes between the two of us. But <laughs> we saw an opportunity to introduce a ethanol prep business on the uh, southeastern seaboard. That was in, in early 2007. We found a, a way to clean fuel tanks. And the fuel tanks I'm talking about are in-ground fuel tanks that 
gas stations, airports. Mm-hmm. You know, there when you start to look at that that industry, there are fuel tanks just about anywhere you could imagine. Oh yeah. So we got into this fuel tank cleaning business as the Eastern Seaboard was um, having ethanol introduced into their fueling system, and that was a really challenging experience. Uh, we put everything on the line, and I, I have great respect for my dad because he he put you know 30 years of electrical contractor on the line to start that business with me. And boy, it wasn't easy. We went from uh, buying this uh, this system that would clean fuel tanks and uh, experiencing some real setbacks with that to the point where we had to to either pack up shop and start over and and uh, we were potentially going to lose everything uh, or try to make our own system and that's what we did we we redesigned a system that would work specifically with the fuel tanks in the southeast because these tanks were very very challenging to clean i won't go into details with this but the things that really created uh, i think and built character with me through that experience are uh, you know my dad and i were at the point where we couldn't get hotel room you know we would sleep in our truck and uh just really fighting for every every penny that we made yeah and we turned that business around and in um just through a lot of perseverance we're able to turn it into a profitable business and build it up over a few years and do pretty well with it and then we sold it in uh, the spring of 2013 mm-hmm so there was a lot of uh, a lot of family sacrifice, you know, with my wife and kids, and um, just being on the road with my dad and and working together and building this thing up. And so that was a a really great experience for me to experience to, to be with my dad and work with him and see his uh, determination and go through that that trial and and uh, experience the success of that hard work and sacrifice oh, yeah. with him. And so we sold the business and, you know, of course, during that time, I'm always, my mind is uh, always uh, distracted with my car hobby. <laughs> and that was a lot of times the, the cars are what, you know, it's, it's the place that you go to uh, unwind and, and just, it's more than just uh, something you drive. It starts to become a lot more than that. And I think that's where it kind of shaped for me. The, the passion went so much deeper and I started to realize that the just I think my own connection with if I were to design a car someday what would it look like and what what do I really want in a car and you know having these older 911s and 912s and then the, the slant nose turbo really fun cars to own but I kind of came to this place where and this is this is something that is pretty goes deep with my family is you sometimes get to a place where something doesn't exist and you have an idea that you want to make it exist. And that's where a lot of people, I think, especially today, just accept what's available to them. But with my family, I realized, and with my dad, when something doesn't exist, that's kind of where the dreams come alive. And that's where I see uh, my, my dad has really been an inspiration to me in sitting down with a pen and paper and you start to create and then you do it you know (laughs) (laughs) fantastic yeah so that that kind of brings me into the here now of um getting to the point where i i had the opportunity to build my own car and it was through a a really interesting call phone call that i made on an old porsche that was for sale in south dakota it was a 67 912 and I saw it for sale just a few minutes after it went on Craigslist in, I think that was 2011, early 2011. And uh, it was what sounded like a little old lady that answered the phone. And as I got to talking with her, I learned that her husband had passed away. She was a, had been widowed. And he had a lot of the same interest in automobiles as I did. And he was kind of a hoarder. So... He had these barns full of old Porsche, uh, Volkswagen, uh, Corvair, a lot of air-cooled stuff wow. out in South Dakota. And he also had metal shaping and fabrication 
tools. So she and I kind of, we struck a deal that if I were to use the tools for my own purposes, and I told her I really wanted to try building my own car, uh, she agreed to give me a pretty good deal on the 912 as well as all these tools. Wow. So I uh, made a few trips out with a 24-foot enclosed trailer and packed it as full as I could and spent all my money (laughs) and (laughs) came back to our hobby farm and set up shop in the barn where we used to store these cars. I parted out a lot of that Porsche in order to buy an old Formula V race car because as I did some research on the car that I would build, you know, I wanted it mid-engine. I wanted it to have the early Porsche VW stamps and styling cues and drivetrain because it's easy to work on. And the Formula V just fit the bill, but I needed to modify that Formula V chassis to create the car that I wanted. So it had the right the right components, but it was going to take some fabrication. And so I dove in head first. I got that Formula V car uh, down in Virginia and trailered it back up here. And I started chopping and welding and modifying. I had no idea what I was doing outside of, I mean, I don't have any formal training. I just have a really very, very overly (laughs) uh, obsessive passion for Porsche. So, I mean, at 14 and 15 years old, I was reading excellence was expected. It's the Porsche Bible. Oh, yeah, sure. So I have a pretty good understanding of how they did things back in that, um, specifically with that post-World War II era of racers that were built out of the rubble of war-torn Germany, you know? Yeah. And that is really fascinating to me because it kind of identifies with sometimes how I felt with my story with our business and, you know, making something out of nothing. Right, and, yeah, rising so, from the ashes. Well, your story is incredible, and what is so interesting about it and what will resonate with a lot of car fanatics is that proverbial barn find. You found this mm-hmm. not only... You you not only had a barn fine car, but a f- barn fine career with this uh, yeah. this lady you met and taking her husband's life passion and reinventing it into your own. It's just a, a wonderful, fascinating story, and uh, I love it. Thank you so much for sharing so much of that. What I want to do now is, as we continue down this amazing journey, is is talk about a success quote. And this is a saying that's been instrumental in forming your life and your success. It's a great way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars, yeah? Although you've already done that with your amazing story. So, Chris, take the wheel. Okay, well, I have two quotes. And uh, I think the first one, it's, it's something a lot of car guys can identify with. And it goes like this. You can't drive a house, but you can always live in a sports car. <laughs> <laughs> and so... That's a, that's a fun one to, um, to my wife, she gets a kick out of that. <laughs> yeah. Whenever you're in the dog house, you can just go out and live in your car. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But as far as really, um, identifying with my day to day work, there's a quote that goes like this. He who works with his hands is a laborer. He who works with his hands and his head is a craftsman. And he who works with his hands his head and his heart is an artist. Mm, And so when I move into the day-to-day activities, it's easy to get in the groove of just a real monotonous pattern with work. And it's so important for me in my work to make sure that my head and my heart are guiding my hands as I go through the day. My shop, you know, and the equipment that I picked up from Uh, Miss Judy Benz out in South Dakota, it's not very modern equipment. And I, it requires me, everything that I do is traditional European coach work, Mm -hmm. you know, and Mm -hmm. literally that idea of, of war torn Germany where (laughs) electricity was hard to come by. That's how I work. And so to remind myself of, of what I am capable of making with my hands and looking at the inspiration of guys who've done it before. Mm -hmm. and they create something out of nothing that really just guides me throughout the day. And it also creates, I think, room for me to step back and take a break as well. 
Because when it starts to, you know, when you get into the first two parts of that quote where you're working with your hands as a laborer or just uh, simply a craftsman, which isn't all that bad, I've realized that I need to be patient with myself and step out and and, uh, come back to something a few hours later. Sometimes I'll move on to a different project for a couple days as well. So it really, it's a good quote to practice and to try to remember uh, every day as I as I do this oh, um, yeah. type of work. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. I love that. Would you share a story with us that instigated your passion for cars? And you may have already said this when you were explaining your your upbringing, but tell us that pivotal moment in your mind when you really knew you were a car guy. Boy, you know, I think the earliest influence of, of really – having fun with the cars and, and uh, being really connected to the cars would probably be in those teenage years with my dad and with my uncle. My uncle did restore uh, cars as a hobby for himself. So just, you know, I don't have a specific memory that comes to mind of, of a pivotal moment, but I remember the time spent with my uncle down at his shop, watching him work on his cars and, uh, going to some car shows with them and, and just seeing the camaraderie and seeing the appreciation from other people for his work and him sharing his stories, you know, seven year restoration on a 56 Chevy Bel Air, just seeing that appreciation that guys had for that type of work. Sure. And that kind of sparked something in me. So I think there was a combination of, of uh, building the camaraderie and then the respect that car guys share with each other. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's uh it's a common thread, I believe, and that combined with that moment of you sneaking under the cover and sitting in that 914 and pretending like you were going down the straight at Lamal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that yeah, moment too. And that really yes, that did it. And you know, there's another there's one, actually one one other thought that comes to mind with this that is really kind of a funny situation, but my dad had a Dawson 240Z, I think that's what it was. I was really young, two mm-hmm. plus two. And we were sitting at a stoplight here in our little town in Minnesota. And I had in my hand a, I think it was like a 124th scale silver Carrera, 911 Carrera, mm-hmm. a little die cast model. And I had it in my hand sitting in the back seat of his Dotson. I remember sitting at the stoplight and I looked up and across the intersection was a silver Carrera just like the one that I was holding. Oh, wow. And it, it was just, it was the coolest thing ever to look at that little car that I was holding on to and then see that car in front of us make a, a turn across the intersection. And again, the styling cues of the 911 just fascinated me. You know, something about that design, it just really stuck with me. Oh, and sure. It was, yeah, that was another real pivotal moment, I think, for me. And certain experiences with different cars go deeper, you know, than, than others. The German design and the attention to engineering really stick with me. It really struck a chord. Of so. course, yeah. I love 911s as well. They've been one of my favorites forever. Now, you may have already mm-hmm. answered this question, but I'll ask it again. Uh, this part of our talk, we kind of get under the hood and get our hands a little dirty and and talk a little bit about a great challenge or even a great failure. And you, you talked about that before, that business venture with your father, and maybe that was a point that pushed you to almost to a breaking point, but more importantly, how you overcame the situation and what you learned from it. Well, you know, I think with um, part part of this story that I've shared where the garage kind of becomes a, a safe haven at times for a lot of guys, you know, where you can go and take your mind off of things. And what went into building my first car was a lot of that just unwinding from that business that we had. And then, you know, the other, a lot of other challenges that I've faced in life, and I won't go into details with them, but my first car um, that I built, very few people have ever heard the the full story, but there are literally, um, you know, there, there are days when it was just so challenging and that car was kind of my out for a lot of the challenges that I faced in life. And uh, there are literally underneath that paint, there were tears shed (laughs) on that aluminum. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. It it goes right along with that quote that I said about um, putting your 
hands, your head, and your heart into what you're doing, because it starts to, I think, for me, what what you what a person has in their in their heart and their life experiences, it comes out somewhere. And for me, it came out in that first car. And so it's just, it was kind of like I had this, a lot of this passion bottled up and this, uh, these design ideas. And then with the experiences that I've gone through and challenges that I faced in life, it came out in, in building that buck, the wooden buck that I used to, to design my car over and, and then start hammering that metal. I think that, um, you know, that without going to be into detail about the challenges, but the idea that, uh, I would just really encourage anybody who listens to this podcast to, um, look at that, the, the depth of what you can do when you, um, start to put your hands in, in your head and your heart into what you're doing and really create, it opens up something and, you know, not everybody can do, they can create and make a living at it. But I've been fortunate enough to begin this process and have people believe in my work to the point where I'm able to pay my bills with it. (laughs) Well, that's a... (laughs) Sometimes it gets scary. (laughs) Yeah, tough. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I hope that that, does that answer your question? Oh, it does. Definitely. No, I can tell the passion and and definitely you have your heart into this. So that's great. The shedding the tears on the aluminum as you pound away at those pieces of metal. Yeah. Fan- fantastic <laughs> and story. And I'm not kidding when I say that. <laughs> no, I, I think we believe yeah. you. Yeah, I understand. Chris's journey is so fantastic and inspiring. I'm going to turn this into two shows. So make sure you listen to part two of Chris Runge's story, where he'll share his aha moment in his career, many of his famous resources, and of course, some parting advice. You can find Chris's show notes pages on carsyad.com slash Chris Runge. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.